affirmation that uh, all of this prayer is really centered around uh, God. Uh, but our last petition today is what we're going to deal with is in Matthew 6 and 13. Uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And uh, so we'll get started uh, with a word of prayer before we start. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for uh, the blessing of being with your people today, how we have uh, rejoiced in worshiping together and fellowshipping together. And we pray, Father, now teach us in this last petition of uh, the model prayer that you gave to us to teach us how to pray. And uh, may we be truthful and, and uh, speak your, your word as, as you intended to be spoken and uh, see what truth you have here for us. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so this is the last of the petitions as we've gone through the model prayer, as I've talked about. Um, you know, they had asked Jesus, teach us to pray. So Jesus said, okay, here, he said, pray then like this, as we said back up in um, verse 9. And so, uh, and as, I, as I've said, it can be. I don't think there's anything wrong with as a group, maybe, uh, reading this together. Uh, reciting this together. Uh, I think probably for young Christians, this is a good place to start when they're new in their faith, where I'm learning how to pray, to even start with this particular prayer and just repeat this prayer. There's certainly nothing wrong with that. But now, this should not be all of our prayer life. It's just, you know, the model prayer. Uh, it's to teach us to pray. And so we kind of can expand out from uh, what, Jesus taught us here uh, to pray in our, you know, in our own way, in our own vernacular, uh, so to speak, our own dialects, uh, but still, still with this sense of uh, that we recognize God as the Father. He's our Father spiritually, so we recognize that connection with Him. Hallowed or holy uh, be your name, that His name is holy. So when we pray, we're not approaching Him flippantly or casually, but we're praying Him as the holy a ruler of the universe. Your kingdom come that we are praying not just concerning our own needs, our own wants, but we are praying fundamentally concerning first his kingdom. Uh, your will be done, as we've talked about there, about uh, that primarily when we pray, it's not about what is what we desire, but it is about the will of God being done and being exalted in our lives. So we should pray with that. Uh, the giving us this day our daily bread. And so we finally, we see all of these, these petitions here about the Father and about the, ho about the holiness of God and His kingdom and His will. And so finally we get to, where do you get to pray about our needs? Well, this is where we pray about our needs. Give us this day our daily bread. We're trusting, as Paul talked about this morning, day by day. We're trusting daily for God's provision. Uh, I thought that was an excellent illustration about the, the children of Israel there in the uh, out in the wilderness. When did they get their food for the day? In the morning. <laughs> and so uh, we pray daily for our, our provisions, for God to provide for us. We trust Him. We recognize this. He, he is the one that supplies that to us. Forgiving us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. We, we really talked about that, that uh, you know, our, the sign that we have been forgiven is our willingness really uh, somewhat a lot in part that we are willing to forgive others. If God has forgiven us of so much, should we not be able to forgive our brothers and sisters in Christ and even our enemies? As, as Jesus uh, prayed, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. And then we come today to this uh, last petition, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So, generally, as I got into this study, there's probably always a question that comes up in in our minds or the people's minds, there's a question in mind here that many have probably asked, why did Jesus, why did Jesus say we should pray for something that we know God is not going to do? And that is to deliver us into evil. We know God's not going to deliver us into evil. Uh, James 1 and 13 says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. And then in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16, he said, It is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. So if God is absolutely holy, He cannot and will not tempt us to perform evil. He's not going to do that. Uh, now sometimes 
people blame God for the evil that comes in their lives. Uh, I, I still think about in the Garden of Eden even, when uh, Adam partook of the fruit that God had commanded him directly not to partake of, but then Eve said, here, have some of this. <laughs> what did Adam say? Yeah, I don't know if you ever caught this or not. Well, this woman, you gave me. <laughs> uh, she gave me of it, and I partook of it. So why did Jesus say to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil? Okay, why the petition? Number one, I believe, is that Jesus knew that temptations slash trials would come for the apostles, the disciples, the followers of Christ. Later on, he knew this. He's omniscient. He knew that they were going to fail some tests and there were going to be trials and there were going to be temptations. Uh, now, the word that is used to here is a word that is in the Greek, P-E-R-A-I-S-M-O-S, which is pyrosmos, and it's sometimes translated as trial, but it's also translated as temptation. And the, there's not two different words for, these, for trial or temptation. It's the same word. So how you determine the translation of it has, it has a neutral meaning, so the translation depends on context. Context, as I've said before, means everything. The context of the scripture, the historical context means everything. And when it regards God and believers, then the word test or trial is used because it means or meant for the purpose of proving a believer, strengthening our faith, uh, and never for the purpose of evil. Turn, if you would, over for a moment to James chapter 1. James chapter 1 and there in verses 2 through 4. James 1, 2 through 4. And so James writes here, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. I think in the, in the King James Version, the trials there is translated temptations. And really in the context, the trials is the more proper word to use here because he's talking about trials that test their faith that produces steadfastness as he says there and then perfection and completeness and what he's meaning in there lack it for, for maturity in their walk with the Lord growth in their walk for the Lord so that the proper word to use in that particular context is trials it's the same Greek word now when it regards when this word is used and in the context it regards evil or the evil one, Satan, the word temptation is used because it is, it is speaking of an inducement to do evil, uh, to do something sinful, to cause someone to fall. And so I was trying to think of some examples of this. Uh, a, a, a example of a, of a test that improved or increased faith, if you think about Abraham, and he was commanded by God to sacrifice Isaac. That was a test. That was a trial that produced and increased his faith. He, and he passed the trial, the test and the trial. A temptation for evil would be Ananias and Sapphira <laughs> over in, in Acts in the early church who were tempted by evil or by the evil one. And guess what happened? They succumbed <laughs> uh, to the temptation and they died for it. Uh, and so... All of us as believers are going to be tested by God for the purpose of proving an increasing of our faith. Uh, the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 6 and 7 said, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So again there, same Greek word, but he's speaking here specifically of those trials, those tests in our Christian life that will prove our faith, that will increase us in faith, and that will make our walk with the Lord more mature. So, but it understands here to, it helps us to understand this petition 
when we understand that the temptations are inducements for us to fail and perform evil and trials are for the improving or the increase of our faith. Secondly, why the reason for this petition? Well, it acknowledges that when it comes to resisting evil, we are weak <laughs> and must have divine help. We're weak. Let's be honest. We're weak when it comes to temptation. Uh, if you think Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, in a perfect world, so to speak, uh, they succumbed to those temptations. So to pray this acknowledges our own weakness in regards to the resistance of evil temptations. And there's not any of us, I'm sure, in this room that have not failed in that regard. And so Jesus was praying, or was giving this example that we need to be praying consistently, if not daily, regarding resisting evil, resisting these indu inducements to sin. Uh, the Apostle Paul uh, acknowledges in Romans 7, 14 through 25, the struggle we have as believers in the flesh uh, with the sin and temptation. And just to highlight a couple of those verses out of that, verses 14 and 15 in Romans 7, he says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm of the flesh, sold under sin. I don't understand, I don't, for I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Have you ever succumbed to a temptation and evil and then thought, well, that was stupid. Why did I do that? I knew better than to do that, but I succumbed to that temptation. Why did I do that? And so Paul quite very well understood this temptation to sin, just being still in these bodies, in this remnant of the world. We still have this flesh. We still succumb to that sometimes. So the great apostle Paul, he recognized his own weakness in regards to these temptations to evil. And so let me say this. We would be foolish to think that we, number one, we won't be tempted. It's, it, it would be foolishness to think that you're not ever going to be tempted. It, it's sort of like, you know, these guys, these monks that used to go into these monasteries and, and uh, cloister themselves off into the world or these people that go into little communes and they think, if I go here, I'm going to insulate myself against sin and the temptation of sin. No, you're not because you're still in this body. Uh, and so that's foolish to think that and it's even more foolish to think that we can resist these temptations without God's help. You, you cannot resist temptation without God's help. It, 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 it's impossible to do that, to think that you can do, to do that in the flesh. And so, uh, and we see examples like that in the scriptures and other places. We remember Peter? He learned his lesson the hard way, didn't he? Uh, he boasted in Matthew 26 and 35, what did he say? I'll never forsake you. Lord, all these others are going to deny you, but Lord, I'm not, I'm going to go to the death for you. And they, and it, but it says, if you notice in that particular passage of Scripture, it says they all agreed with him. They all said, oh no, we're all, none of us are going to deny you, none of us are going to run. And what happened? Pew, they all scattered. Uh, and so, you know, he denied Christ three times and they all scattered to their own place. And even after his resurrection, what do we find? They're still hiding, you know, in the room. He gets, shows up to them after his resurrection and they're still all hiding in a room. Uh, so they, they, they boasted, but they failed the test because they were not relying on the strength of God that, that he gives. Uh, and we see it in, in other examples in the scripture. Uh, we've talked about this one a lot in our men's Bible study. King David, man after God's own heart, wrote tremendous great psalms, but he succumbed to temptation with Bathsheba. Wrong place, wrong time. And, uh, you know, and, and he didn't resist that temptation. It resulted in, in great, uh, great consequences to him. And that's what happens when we succumb to temptation then we will, we're going to, there's going to be consequences to that, both in, at least spiritually in our relationship with the Lord and our fellowship with Him, and in other ways many times. And I just talked about a few moments ago when, when Abraham, his faith was tested and he uh, reacted in faith and he went ahead and went to sacrifice Isaac and he was obedient, but he wasn't always. <laughs> he, he, he didn't always pass the test. Uh, you remember in two, not once 
but two different times in Genesis 12, 10 through 20 when he went down to Egypt, and then in, in chapter 21 through 18, uh, when, when Abraham and Sarah went into a land, Abraham said, you know, Sarah, you're a beautiful woman, and somebody's going kill to me, kill me to get you. And he says, so why? <laughs> and tell them that you're my sister. Now, that was half true. She was his half-sister. It was a, but you know what a half-truth is, don't you? It's a lie. <laughs> so... He failed those tests in that place. And that reminds me of the phrase. I've heard uh, Alistair Begg say this several times. He says, the best of men are men at best. So in, even at our best, we on our own cannot resist temptation without God's help. And so we should, and, and let me say this, it is, as I think about that example of Abraham, have you ever said, have you ever thought when you've succumbed to a temptation or committed a sin or some act of, you know, against God said, so, well, I'll never do that again. Don't say that. <laughs> because it happened, Abraham did pull the same thing twice. And so, uh, anyway, uh, you know, Psalm 103, 14 says, for he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. Uh, and so, uh, important verse to remember. And so Jesus understood the necessity for us praying for this. Do not lead us into temptation. Deliver us from evil. We need your strength. So thirdly, this third point really is connected to the second point. It ag acknowledges the absolute necessity of praying for God's help. It's a logical conclusion to that previous point there. We need to be diligent in asking God to help us to resist temptation. You remember when Jesus, he took the apostles with him before the night of his, his, uh, his betrayal and he was in great agony. He told them to stay there and watch and pray, you know, to stay there. And he came back and they were asleep. And he came and he said, he says, he said, he, and he told them, he ends up telling them in, in both in Luke 2, 22 and 40 and, and, uh, and Matthew 26 and 41. He says, watch and pray that you may not enter in temptation. You know the easiest way to fall into temptation? Become prayerless. A prayerless Christian is one who is going to fall into temptation. And so, you know, the spirit, and he, and he added, the Lord added, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We're all prone to make boast about things that we're not ever going to do. Be careful about sitting on ju in judgment on certain sins that people commit that are believers and say, well, I would never do that. Be careful about saying that. Uh, don't become an apostle Peter and boast in your own strength. The strength comes when we pray daily, do not lead us into temptation and deliver us from the evil, the evil consequences of that, what that means. So, I ask again the question, are we addressing this need daily or at least in a very consistent basis? Let me ask you that question, believer. Are you praying for God to protect you from yielding to temptation and from the evil that comes with that and the consequences that comes with that. Brother Paul talked about this morning about abiding. Uh, this is part of that abiding. If you're going to abide in Christ, if you're going to walk with the Lord, if you're going to, if you're going to grow in Him, uh, you need to be, and I might say all of us, need to be seeking God consistently in this way to Lead us not to that, but deliver us from this evil. And so, you know, we've already addressed how that temptations for evil and the evil one, some places, some, some versions uh, translate this evil, others translate it the evil one. The word is very close. It's used in this Greek word that's used here. It's translated both ways. It really, it's really not a lot of differences. Uh, you know, the evil one, ultimately he is the, the author of all evil. Uh, but in this, because we've already recognized that in this body we're gonna we're gonna be we're gonna have temptations, we're gonna sin. Uh, but we all recognize also recognize there are other avenues for temptation. What we see with our eyes, what we hear with our ears, and just basically just from being in the world, just being in the world. You know, a lot of people say, well, "Man, if it'd be just wonderful, we could just live at church all the time in the fellowship of the saints." That would be great in some respects, but God's also commanded us to, to work. 
<laughs> and to provide for our families and, and that, those kind of things. We have to get out into the world. Uh, in 1 John 2 and 16, uh, John said, For all that is in the world, means the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. That was 1 John 2 and 16. So we understand being in the flesh, we're going to have those desires in the world. We're going to be tempted just because we're in the flesh. Also, he talks about here the desires of the eyes. What do we look at? What do we behold? To a very large extent here, and I think there, it's recognized, well, there's a recognition here of our responsibility in regards to what we see, what we listen to, who we listen to, who we keep company with. Are those things that we are watching, listening to, you know, things that we are doing, inserting ourselves into the company that we keep, are we being wise about those things in that? Uh, you know, uh, your cell phone, your computer, your TV, your social media pages, the places you go, the movies, music we listen to, can and will lead us into evil as Christians if we are not discerning. The Lord didn't mean here, turn off your discernment and you pray this and just look at whatever you want to and listen to whatever you want to and associate with whoever you want to. He wasn't saying that. Uh, you know, we need to be discerning. And let me say, no, I'll say this. I've been there and done that. I've been guilty of myself of allowing temptations of evil to come into my mind and my life. And, and it, it, you know, just say, I just opened that door up and invited them in. If you open that door up and invite them in, Guess what? Those temptations are just going to walk in. So we need to be discerning about those things. Uh, so we, but still pray for God's strength. Be discerning and pray. But we also recognize, we recognize also that these temptations to evil sometimes do come without your control. We're out in society. We go to work. We're out shopping. Uh, things like that. Sometimes uh, we work, we're work. we subjected to things that we didn't want to partake in that are inducements to evil, do we not? You hear somebody using ugly language. Do what? Yeah, billboards everywhere. We're driving down the road. It's like, you know, uh, you can't help but see those things. I, I don't suggest, yeah, billboards, I don't suggest closing your eyes while you're... <laughs> <laughs> while you're doing that. But you understand, I understand what you're saying. There are those things out there. You walk into a store, some music is on that is not godly, it's very lewd or whatever like that. That, you know, you didn't ask for that, you didn't turn that station on or whatever that song on or whatever. You know, that, that, that's, in, but that's in your mind now. Uh, you're out and you're working and things like that and you, you hear conversations in the world, you can't make people in, our, in, a, in a democratic or republic society, uh, they have freedom basically to say what they want to. And sometimes th those conversations, most often the time, are not conducive to your Christian living. Uh, so we have to pray. We need, God, we need God's help in this for these temptations and not to be delivered into evil in these things. We need, we need that. And, and we know from the scriptures that God is certainly willing and able to help us, is he not? I think this is what he's I mean, we, we know this from this, him saying to repeat this, I, if you pray this, I'm going to help you. <laughs> the Father is going to help you in this area. Uh, if you go back uh, to Luke, I'm going to read a passage from Luke, I've made reference here, uh, chapter 22, and uh, verses 31 and 32. We'll find out, we'll see here the willingness of the Lord to help us through these things. In chapter, verse 31 through 32, Jesus said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. The Lord already knew Peter was going to fail. But 
He's not, he, Satan doesn't get to have you. You're mine. <laughs> and I'm going to strengthen you. And then later on, you're going to be able to come along and encourage the brothers and encourage them in their trials and temptations and preach the word and help build the church in that. And in verse 40 of this same chapter, it says, When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray again that you may not enter into temptation. And so Jesus, or before, even before Peter had failed him, he had prayed for him in this, for, for, for divine protection that his faith would not fail. Also we know Jesus, let me say this, has already prayed for us, has he not? In the high priestly prayer in John 17 and 9, when he's praying to the Father, he says, I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Jesus has already made the promise there. He said, I'm already praying for them. And when he gets to, the, when he gets to heaven, he's, at the, he's our great high priest. He's at the right hand of the throne of God interceding for us at the throne of grace and mercy that we are commanded to come to. If we come to the Lord and say, help me through this time. I'm being tempted to evil. Lord, give me strength. Guess what? He's going to give you grace and mercy to get through that temptation without failing him. Uh, also in 1 John 2 and 1 it says we have an advocate with the Father. A legal representative with the Father. He is there at the Father's right hand. And we come to Him in our times of need and certainly this is a need. This is something that we need strength for. And we know that when we pray in such a way God will provide sufficient strength and help. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10 and 13 No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability with the temptation. He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. That's a promise of God. That's a promise that he has made that whatever temptation, if you fail a temptation, it is not because God has failed you. Don't blame it on God and don't blame it on the devil. Uh, there used to be a comedian and I, I date myself by saying this from years ago, uh, the devil made me do it. No, if you fail, it's not the devil didn't make you do it. And you certainly weren't depending on God to resist that temptation. God is always sufficient when we pray for this help in temptation to deliver us from evil. That's a prayer. If, if you pray that, I believe that God will always answer that prayer in the affirmative. If you genuinely want to be and have a desire to honor him and be delivered from that evil. Uh, 2 Peter 2 and 9 says, The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptations. Amen. And I thought of this uh, illustration. I didn't have it in my notes, but I thought of it after I'd finished my notes out. Think about Joseph. Uh, the, 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 uh, his, he, the master that he worked for and the wife came to him and tried to get him to commit some sexual immorality. Guess what? Joseph, he ran. He said, well, that was kind of chicken. No, that was doing the right thing. Now, he, had, he suffered for it. And sometimes you might, because of resisting an evil temptation, suffer for it. You might suffer the loss of friends, the disapproval of society. But you'll be in right relationship and right fellowship with God. Yes. That was part of God's purpose. He was obedient to God and God put him in the right place at the right time to save the nation of Egypt from starvation. And it kind of relates to the Sunday morning message talking about how God put particular people in history, one particular man in history, places them there. And in that particular place, it was for not just Israel's benefit, but it also benefited Egypt. It delivered many Millions of people from starvation and death. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Well, and, and, and you think about how important this is, and this kind of comes to my next point. The last point is it recognizes, number four, it recognizes God's desire for holiness in our lives. The, world's watch, the world is watching, that's for sure. The testimony thing that you're talking about there, Andre, that's for sure. The world is watching. You say you're a Christian, they're going to watch and see. Is your speech different? Is the way you work different? 
the way you act different, treat your wife different, or or your husband. I mean, equal time. Absolutely, and, and it might affect and it affects people's view of God. Also, they say, "Well, you're a Christian, and there's no difference in your life than mine. Why should I seek salvation? Why should I seek Jesus Christ for salvation?" You know, so it's important on a whole number of levels there. But our calling, as we know, uh, is is for holiness in our lives. Of course, first to, first Peter one and sixteen: "Be ye holy, for I am holy." Uh, it affects our, our calling for the purpose of being conformed to the image of Christ. Romans 8 and 30, that we are, we are basically chosen to be conformed uh, to the image of Christ. And so this is a really a way of practical putting on of, of us being responsible for that conforming because we are responsible to be praying this uh, in this. He's not saying that I'm going to do this for you whether you pray for it or not. And he's saying, no, this is part of your human responsibility. I'm sovereign, but this is part of your human responsibility as a Christian to pray, to not enter into temptation and be delivered from evil. God's desire is not, as I've said before, temptation is going to occur, but God's desire is never for us to succumb to those temptations, but to resist and be obedient to what he's called us to, what he's called us to be like. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 7, For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. I've heard people excuse their, their sexual immorality or something, or their habit of lying, or their drunkenness. They say, oh well, God knows how I am, and I'm sure he's going to forgive me for it. And to, something to that extent. Uh, or or God, I'm going to go ahead and do this, and God will forgive me for it. That's foolishness. Our sinfulness is, is, is not going to get excused uh, if we're, if we're not seeking Him, or there's going to be consequences for that. He's called us to this purpose of impure, for, for purity, not impurity, and sanctification. 2 Corinthians 7 and 1. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Every believer in this church, every believer in this world, is called to be conformed to holiness, to prove holiness in their lives, to cleanse themselves from every defilement of body. Now, we're not going to completely do that in this life. You know, we're not going to eradicate ourselves of every sin in our lives. But our striving, our desire, is to that we would hate sin more and more. I mean, I hope that you hate sin now more than you did the day you were saved. That's how we ought to be uh, as believers. And I've already quoted Romans 12 and 2. And another example, if you, and I, I mentioned this I think in the morning message, but the first three chapters of Ephesians are the, found, the doctrinal foundation of our Christian lives. But from chapter 4 on, Paul begins to teach the Ephesian believers concerning practical sanctification. And, there, and, and before he does that, in chapter 4, in Ephesians 3, 14, and 16, he says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. Notice this, this is the posture of prayer. From whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being. He's already given us the Holy Spirit. We pray and we seek his face. We need the increase of his strength in our lives to, redo, to, to not be led into temptation, to be delivered from evil, and to grow in holiness and in sanctification. So, you know, the question is, do you have enough strength on your own? The answer to that is a resounding no. <laughs> that that's, you're not going to have that. God has strengthened us to be able to resist and flee from temptation through the Holy Spirit and through asking Him to strengthen us. And let me ask you the question. Are you concerned about holiness and sanctification in your life? Are you as a believer? Are you concerned about that? We need to be. We should be. Uh, to not be is to reveal a problem on one level or another. Uh, either 
regarding your salvation or regarding at least where you are in your walk? Uh, are you concerned with being conformed to the image of Christ? Do you care? Do you other people see Christ in you? Do they? Do you know yourself if you are more and more conformed to the image of Christ now than you were the day you were saved? I mean, we're supposed to be growing in that. Are we concerned about those things? If we are, then we're to actively and consistently pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And as I said, he has promised he's going to hear those prayers because we've already revealed in his word that he is certainly willing and able to help us with that. And his desire is that we might not succumb to temptation but be delivered from evil and walk in holiness. So he, I think he will certainly respond affirmatively, affirmatively to this prayer by the believer. Any other comments or questions uh, regarding that passage? That's a great verse. Yes, lead me in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Yes, that would be that would be a great verse to go along with that, uh, and you know uh, it really would be uh, in that. Well, that is really a mystery that we don't know, kind of understand. The scriptures does says that he did increase in wisdom. Now, how did that work with him being the eternal Son of God? Uh, I'll have to I'll have to ask that question. That's not one of those questions that you know is that affects whether your stature as far as being accepted in the church or not. But that, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a question, interesting question to probe. And I think we've talked about this before. I don't know that I really know the answer to that question. I, I think there was at some point in time, I, just from my surmising that, he, you know, like as, as babies, as infants, I don't have any memories back that far. Now, Jesus, I'm sure he was different from other babies. <laughs> Right. <laughs> right. And that to me magnifies, it doesn't nullify God, it magnifies the Son. Right. Yes. Yeah. That's me. Yes. Yes. And I think all through that period of time, he was without sin. E- even, even as a child. You know, I mean, you know, I, we love our children, or they're precious, and our, and our, and our grandchildren, and things like that. And we say, oh, they're just little angels. Mm, uh, no, they're not. But they're little sinners. But <laughs> you know, you don't have to teach them how to sin, or how to say no, or how to be selfish, or any of those kind of things. But I think with Jesus, none of the, he never had any of those characteristics. Even I don't think as as an infant. That's, that's right. He had a, he had a very early uh, awareness of that. I don't know what I don't know. None of us can pinpoint a specific age because we're not told that in the scriptures. But anyway, any other questions or comments? Okay. Well, uh, Brother John, would you dismiss us in prayer, please?